<laughs> okay, so welcome to the music information retrieval course at the University of Victoria. So again, I'll do my uh, say hi to anyone who is watching this somewhere. So far, no one is watching live, but people will watch it later on video. Um, so the topic of today's lecture is going to be uh, data mining. So in some ways, uh, what we have done so far is we did a crash course in digital signal processing, uh, just the bare essentials to get us going with uh, spectrograms and with um, being able to compute audio features. And um, now we're going to move into another part, which is kind of foundations, uh, which is data mining. So you know, you can take a whole course on data mining and machine learning. So of course, we will only cover the basics. But uh, that will give you enough of material combined with the digital signal processing to move into building actual music information retrieval systems. So at this point, I will uh, try to switch to screencasting. So uh, I will do this, screen share. And uh, hopefully, uh, it's now showing the slides. So if at any point the slides disappear, if anyone is watching here, let me know so that we don't have what happened last time. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, data mining. and. Uh, there's going to be two parts to the lecture today, uh, an introduction. And then uh, somewhat uh, uh, unusually, what I will do is I will talk uh, about evaluation. So usually when you learn about classification, you are uh, taught the basic idea. Then you, are, you go through a zoo of different classifiers. And then at the end, you learn how to evaluate uh, what are the procedures for evaluating. Uh, it, in my opinion, the procedures for evaluating are more important because you can easily find implementations of classifiers. And uh, that's why I start backwards. So we'll pretend that there's this magic box that does the classification, and we'll just see how we can uh, evaluate it. So in a nutshell, uh, I love this quote. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, it says, essentially, all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. And it's a co quote by a guy named George Box, who actually passed away relatively recently, last year. Uh, so he got interested in performing experiment in statistics after performing experiments where they were trying poison gas to small animals to see sort of how many would die with certain exposures and so forth. Um, and it's a very important quote that, you know, there's no correct model. We are always approximating in some ways, but some models can be really useful. So uh, that's the idea behind data mining and uh, machine learning is we'll build some models. They will not be perfect, uh, but they, we will get quite a bit of mileage out of them. So a little bit about terminology. Uh, the same kind of ideas uh, have different names depending on which community works on them. So when uh, computer science theory people do this, they call it machine learning. Um, at some point, database people got wind of that and decided, well, we can use that with data and big data and started calling it data mining. And uh, if you talk to a statistician, they would just say, well, they're just doing statistics and they're calling it something different. So it really is statistics under the hood. And uh, it ha gets the fancy name of artificial intelligence if you are uh, in applied computer science. But the underlying ideas behind these categories are the same. And there's significant overlap, although uh, each term has uh, its own flavor. And one thing that I think is really important to understand, and it's something that I even I've been working with uh, machine learning techniques for close to 10, 12 years now, uh, I still haven't completely gotten my head around this, is that it's a different way of programming a computer, really. So we know how to program a computer by giving these precise stepwise instructions when we write in a programming language. 
but uh, we can also have a computer perform some task, and in many cases, tasks that we could never write an actual computer program that would solve that task uh, by these methods of data mining and machine learning. So uh, we will be looking through that. So it looks like we have two views. Maybe they're all in this room. But uh, uh, if you are viewing this uh, from away, and uh, if you could mute your microphone, that will avoid some problems with the Hangouts. Looks like everyone is muted, so it's fine. OK, so the problem setting. So what is the idea of learning? What, how can we say a system learns? So a computer program, uh, this is a definition uh, by Tom Mitchell, who has written a really nice book on machine learning. A computer program learns from experience E with respects to tasks T measured by a performance measure P means that the performance at these tasks, as measured by P, improves with the experience. So this might sound a little bit either too obvious or too confusing, so I'll try to give you a specific example. Uh, a chess program learns from playing chess with human players. So you have it be online, and it will play games. And uh, the measure of its performance is how many games it wins. If it is a learning program, as it plays more games, it will start winning more games. So the key issue is the improvement, is not the absolute performance. So you might have a chess program that's great, that beats a world champion, but if its behavior doesn't change with experience, it's not learning. You might have a very lousy uh, chess program, but uh, if its, a, if it's um, performance improves with time, then uh, it is a learning algorithm. OK, so, um, so some definitions. So classification or supervised learning is the machine learning task of predicting or inferring the class of an object. Typically, that it, the object is represented as a vector of numbers by analyzing training data consisting of uh, these feature vectors which represent the objects and associated labels. So again, this might seem a little bit uh, unclear, uh, but here is an example. So I just want to check. Do the slides look OK in the Hangout? OK. Um, so uh, this is a problem. So suppose I give you a database that contains the height and weight of 1,000 people, as well as a binary attribute that tells me whether a person is a basketball player or uh, not, a professional basketball player or not. Uh, since we are in Canada, you can substitute basketball with hockey if that makes more sense. Uh, so you're given some training data. And then I give you the height and weight of 100 new people. And you are asked to predict whether they are professional basketball players or not. And that's called a testing set. So for that set, we don't know what they are. And the metric of performance is how many correct predictions we will do. Okay. So now I'm going to um, give you a specific example. So this gentleman here, I uh, can't even remember what his real name is, but he's called The Rock. His nickname is The Rock. He's a wrestling guy. He has played in some movies. And he's a pretty big guy. So uh, the question is, if you weigh as much as this guy, and if your height is as much as this height is as much as this guy, are you a professional basketball player or not? So how many of you think he would be classified as a professional basketball player by height and weight? Okay, maybe five. How many of you think he would be classified as a normal human being? <laughs> OK. So now uh, I'll just show you a picture. This is uh, The Rock between Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal, who are professional basketball players. And as you can see, he looks like a tiny midget. Uh, so <laughs> he, you know, even this really big guy uh, is small compared to basketball players. Anyway, this is just to. Uh, lighten up the lecture. So here is how this would look from a machine learning perspective. Um, you would have some training data here on the left. So this is your uh, 
training set. And as you can see, I have height in centimeters, weight in kilograms, and uh, a binary attribute whether you are a professional basketball player or not. And uh, so a feature matrix is a 2D matrix where each row, uh, so each row which we call an instance or a sample, corresponds to one particular person. So this row right here could be uh, the row for the rock or the row for one of you. Uh, so it gives you um, a height and a weight. And then um, uh, you can also think of the columns as attributes. So height is an attribute, uh, weight is an attribute, and depending on the problem we will have a lot of features. So these are the numbers that characterize a particular object and then we have an associated class label, the zero. So this says that this particular person has a height of 195, a weight of 110, and is of uh, type zero. Um, so uh, finally, you have a column that corresponds to the attribute. So this is the definition of a training set and a testing set. And essentially, the name of the game is how can we use this part as input, the left matrix, to build some kind of program that will take as input one of those rows and predict with reasonable accuracy what the class will be for these question marks. OK? All right, so let's move on. So let's formalize this a little bit with mathematical notation. So you have a set of training vectors xi. They live in a, a d-dimensional space of real numbers. Uh, the i is the index in terms of the instances. And n is the number of instances. And d is the dimensionality of the feature vector. So d, in the case of the basketball example, would be 2 because we have only two attributes. And n would be 1,000 because we have 1,000 examples in our training set. And the associated ground truth classification labels can be written as integers uh, y, i, with a subscript i that connects the two. OK? So, uh, so a classification algorithm typically supports two operations. So train, the train operation takes as input the label training set and outputs a model. And a model is some kind of representation of a computer program that uh, is a representation of the classifier for that particular problem. So the model is a model for a particular problem. So it would be uh, some procedure for determining whether someone is a professional basketball player or not. And then the other mode of the classifier is called prediction. And that one takes as input a trained model and an unlabeled testing set. So that was the matrix on the right with the question marks and produces a predicted label test set, which is a 1D vector of labels. So after classification, the question marks here would be replaced with predicted labels. Okay? Some of them would be correct. Some of them would be incorrect. And a good classifier would have a lot of correct predictions. A perfect classifier would classify everything uh, correctly. OK, so at this point, are there any questions? All right. I will quickly uh, check here. So uh, we have two online participants, uh, if they want to ask any. So anyone who is online, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the group chat, and I'll sort of check with the corner of my eye. So um, OK, so now let's continue with evaluation. And this is really important to understand evaluation. OK, so the evaluator. So Suppose I have my uh, classifier and I predict my labels. I sort of predict who is going to be a basketball player and who is not. Uh, I need to somehow know what the correct answer is. So in fact, even for the testing matrix, I do know the la I, I should have the labels in order to evaluate the performance. But I don't use that information in training the classifier. So I have two labeled sets. One labeled set is used for training uh, 
another labeled set is used for testing. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so the evaluation consists of taking the predicted labels, the ground truth labels, so two vectors, comparing them somehow, calculating some metrics, and uh, telling us something about it. So the classifier is really treated as a black box. So uh, uh, one example that I like to give is, suppose you're a company and you give a contract to two companies to build a classification system. They don't tell you how they do it. They just give you a program, you run it, you see how it does, and you pick one versus the other. You don't know how they achieved that task. They might have a human to do it, or they might have a machine. All you care is how well they do it, OK? So an example, the classification accuracy can be computed as the percentage of labels that were correctly predicted. So the ones where the ground truth and the prediction label match. So you just count how many times you have both labels be the same. OK? Um, so in order to evaluate classification, ground truth is needed not only for the training, but for the testing. Uh, so, usually you have some amount of data that is labeled, which comes from the problem set. Usually labeling is labor intensive, so you just have some collection of data who is labeled. So suppose I'm a company, I have a database of records, I have the labels, but I want to make a program that can predict new records. So I need to have some kind of scheme for splitting those that label data into two parts. One part that I will use for training and one part that I will use for testing. In the company scenario, I might give the training data to the contractors and keep the testing data myself and then when they give me their programs, I will run it on the testing data that I have kept and see how well it does. Okay? Um, so this is the scenario that I mentioned in this slide. You contact two companies, and they don't want to tell you how you do it. They just provide you a black box. But the point is that you can run that black box on any data that you want. So you don't have to run it on the data that you gave them. You can run it on data that you have kept secret to see how well they do. So, um, so how do you choose which company to, to use? Okay, so obviously you could say, okay, how well did you do on the data that I gave you? One company might say, I think we are doing 95% classification accuracy. The other might say, I think we are doing 80% classification accuracy. You might be tempted to say, okay, I'll pick the one with the highest accuracy. But then you say, well, let me check on some data that they have not seen. You check on that data and you find out that the company that said that is doing 90% is performing at 60%. And the company that said 80 is performing at 82. In that case, you will probably pick the 80% company because their estimate was reliable. Okay? So this is kind of the game you have to play with machine learning is you have to uh, think about that scenario because we're not interested in the performance on data you have the classifier has seen. We're interested in the performance of the classifier and data that it has not seen. So uh, just to make this a little bit more concrete, if you have some training data, uh, let's say you have an estimate of the accuracy that the contracted companies somehow do. So they take the training data, somehow they estimate how well the algorithm will perform. That's the 90% and the 80%. Then I have the, the company that's contracting has some data uh, that it's keeping on its own to keep them honest. So let's call that GA for generalized accuracy. So that's the accuracy estimated on new data. So the real challenge is how can I estimate EA so that it's as close as possible to GA? So as a company, I want to have a good handle of how well will my classifier do on unknown data. But I don't have access to that unknown data. So it's what is a scheme I can use to sort of simulate that scenario. Okay? So with me so far, uh, any questions? All right. <clears throat> 
So, um, so this concept in machine learning is called generalization. So generalization is the ability of an algorithm to perform well on new examples of data that are not part of the data that it was trained on. Okay? So estimating the generalization performance is not trivial, but it's at the heart of a good classification system. And the reason why it's not trivial is because you have this problem of overfitting. So overfitting is when your model starts um, trying to fit the data too much and starts modeling noise and errors in your data. So if you have a very complex model, it starts to capture your data really well, but in a way that doesn't generalize uh, very well. So uh, when overfitting, the estimated performance of a machine learning algorithm can be misleading and far from the true generalization performance. Uh, so a simple example would be a memorizing classifier. So suppose you, uh, if you find an entry that's in your training set, you classify it with the label that it is in the training set. That classifier would work perfectly well for your training data. It just matches everything to its own self. But if you give it anything different than what it has seen, it has no way of determining what to do. Okay? So that's the concept of generalization and overfitting are very important. So there's different schemes for splitting uh, the training and testing set. Uh, so now we are at the perspective of a company that has received this data and tries to build a classifier and it needs to somehow get a good estimate of the generalization accuracy. So to do that, um, because the results can be misleading as a result of overfitting, um, if you uh, train the data and test, uh, train the classifier and test it on the same data, that's a methodological mistake. The company is not, you want to test it on data you have not seen. So basically, um, what you want to do is have some scheme for splitting your data. Okay, so we will look at different schemes. So one simple scheme would be to split it as a percentage. So you say, OK, I will use 75% of my data for training. I'll keep 15% of my data for testing. So there's a trade-off there. If you have more training data, uh, these models are statistical. So typically, the more data you have, the better they work. However, um, if you have more testing data, then you get more reliable results in terms of classification accuracy. For example, if I only predicted one basketball player, well, maybe I predicted it correctly or incorrectly, it will just give me either 100% accuracy or 50% accuracy. That's not particularly informative. Okay, so, um, so somehow we have to deal with that trade-off. Uh, but you can kind of have your cake and eat it too because you're not, you don't have to do this only one time. So one other idea is you can do multiple splits. So I can choose to pick some part of my data for training and another part for testing and estimate my accuracy. And then do that again and estimate my accuracy. And do that multiple times with different partitions and somehow combine the results to produce a final result. OK? So uh, just a side note, this is more of an implementation thing. But sometimes it's useful uh, to keep that in mind, because sometimes you do that type of data shuffling on your own. Uh, frequently, if you have a feature matrix, you need to shuffle the entry. So you just need to reorder them randomly. Uh, so sometimes this happens when you do multiple iterations of splitting into training and testing. Uh, some programming environments provide you with random permutations, uh, but in some cases you need to implement them. So uh, it's relatively simple to implement a random permutation, but not completely trivial. So if you want to look it up, look for new uh, shuffles and uh, things like that. Now, because feature matrices typically are matrices are typically very large, when you do a permutation. Um, you use what are called external permutation vectors. 
so the feature vector is left unchanged in memory, and all you do is you access the matrix through an index that is permuted. So I'll show you a picture. So here, for example, you have your NBA players. The original order would be 1, 2, 3, all the way to 99, if I had 100 vectors. A permutation would be rearranging these numbers to, let's say, you know, these are random numbers, but there's only 170 in this column. There's only 18. It's just a shuffling, okay? So you can't do a shuffling by simply picking up a random number and putting it because that would result in duplicates. Does that make sense? So uh, now if I want to access the permutation, I just go to the 70th entry and read it. And then I go to the 8th entry and read it. So I might have multiple of those permutations. So this is just a side implementation detail. Okay, so... Um, so now comes the one of the most basic uh, validation schemes and one of the most important to understand. And that's called the uh, k-fold cross-validation. So in k-fold cross-validation, you start by doing a shuffling of your data. So first your data gets shuffled around so that it's kind of random. Then you partition the data into k-folds. So you make k subsets of your data. So it would be if you had 100, maybe you do 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Or if you have 1,000, you do, uh, if we do tenfold, you would have a set that has 100, a set that has 100, a set that has 100. Okay? Then what you do is you use one fold for testing and the remaining k minus one folds for training. So if I had 1,000 samples and each fold was 100, I use 900, so nine of those folds for training and one of those folds for testing. And then I change which one I use for testing, so I use another one for testing and the other nine for training. So because I have k folds, I repeat that k times and I get predictions for each fold. So the total number of predictions will be uh, the number of instances because if I have, uh, in one fold, I will do 100, in another, I will do 100, in another, I will do 100 predictions. By the end, I will have done 1,000 predictions. So in terms of number of predictions, you do the same number of predictions as you would if you use your training set for testing. And then you can just calculate the classification metrics you need based on ground truth and prediction. So uh, there is a little bit of a trade-off. If you choose k to be large, uh, then you will have uh, large training sets because you don't have many folds. So if I choose k to be 2, I would have basically two cases, 500 samples and 500 samples. So my classifier would get kind of bigger, but um, the, uh, you, so you get lower bias, but at the same time I would have higher variance because the training sets all end up being similar. Um, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there, but sort of standard numbers, one number that comes up all over the place is tenfold. Sometimes you see fivefold, sometimes you see threefold, uh, but those are that. Notice that there's only one initial shuffle, a fixed number of iterations, one for each fold, and no estimate of the variance in your estimation. Like you just get a single classification accuracy. Uh, when the number of folds equals the number of instances, then, uh, then you have a case where you use all your training samples except one for training, and you test only with one. And that's what's called leave one out evaluation. Leave one out evaluation is quite accurate because you use so much training, but uh, it's also very costly if you have very big data sets. So it's only used when you have a really small data set. Okay? So is k fold cross validation clear? Are there any questions? Okay? So. Um, then uh, I will move on into a different kind of procedure, which is called the bootstrap estimate. So unlike k-fold cross-validation, 
the bootstrap, what you do is you pick random samples from your uh, instances. So instead, so for example, in Kfold, what I would do is if I had to do it in this class, I would break you, let's say, in three groups, and then I would say, you group is, you are going to be testing, those other two groups are going to be training. And then we're going to switch around, but everyone would stay in their groups. Instead, I could say, okay, I'll pick 10 people randomly, and they will be my training. And then I do something. Then I pick, I tell them, sit down again, and I pick 10 people randomly. So the same person might be picked again for training, whereas in, uh, in, in, in uh, Kfold cross-validation, you never pick the same, per the same instance again for testing. You only test once. So it's a little bit like sampling with replacement or sampling without replacement. So the same sample might be selected multiple times, and some samples might not be selected ever. So I might do bootstrapping in this class, and you might never make it to training. Um, but with some math, you can show that if you have uh, n instances, approximately 60% of them will be selected. And if you randomly pick numbers, and approximately uh, 36.8% of them will not be selected. So uh, what you do is th those will be distinct instances. And this is because the same instance might appear more than once. So what you do is you uh, randomly pick n samples, and then you use that for training, and the remaining instances are used for testing. Okay. So you can repeat this process as many times as desired, and that gives you a handle to the variance of your estimation. So if I do that, let's say, 100 times, and every time my classification accuracy comes out as 80%, that's a pretty good result. If sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 40, even if the average might be 80%, that will be pretty terrible because it means that depending on what data I use, my classifier is all over the place. So the variance of the classification is important. So does everyone understand the difference between bootstrapping, where you randomly pick samples, and then you might pick the same case again, and folding, where you just partition and then shuffle the partitions? Now, it's very common that people confuse these. So sometimes people are doing bootstrapping and calling it cross-validation or doing cross-validation and calling it bootstrapping. Uh, so this is, at least to my knowledge, this is the more correct terminology. Uh, now there's a lot of variance on these classification schemes. So uh, there's repeated cross-validation. So what you can do is you can shuffle your data, perform k-fold cross-validation, estimate your performance metrics, and then redo it again with a different shuffle. And every time you do it, you get an estimate. So then you have a sequence of estimates, and you can compute their variance. So that's similar to bootstrapping. You can do multiple rounds, and that's called repeated cross-validation. And uh, another variant is stratification. So uh, suppose you have a problem where the class sizes are very unequal. Uh, so, for example, let's say you're trying to build a classifier between uh, male, female uh, students based on their records in terms of height and weight and, I don't know, whatever else uh, other attributes you have. If you are in engineering, there's a small percentage of female students. So what would happen is that if I did something like tenfold cross-validation, it might be the case that my training set might have no example of a female student, or my testing set might have no example, just randomly, because there's so much of an imbalance in the size of the, each class. So uh, one thing you can do instead is um, do stratified cross-validation. So uh, what that means is that you do the folding in every class separately, and then you merge the classes. So if I had, let's say, uh, 1,000 male students and 100 female students, instead of mixing them up and doing the partitioning, I would say, here's a fold of 100, 
male, here is a fold of 10 female, now I have a fold of 110 that's guaranteed to have 100 male and 10 female. So uh, that is stratification. And you can do stratified cross-validation or stratified uh, bootstrapping. Uh, basically, you just do it separately for each class and then join the results and then run your evaluation metrics. Okay, so uh, this ensures that the number of instances for each class in each fold is approximately the same as the distribution of classes in the training set. So I know this is, it sounds it's a little bit tedious and boring, uh, but it's, it's important to kind of get a hold of this because it really will help you understand uh, how to interpret classification results. Are there any questions? All right, moving on. So, um, so there's other potential variants, and these can be actually quite important for music. So sometimes uh, the folds that you do uh, might make sense if you have some additional information. So uh, if you have multiple collection experiments or time information is included, uh, you might want to do it that way. So if you're doing like music tracks, you might decide instead of doing random folds to do folds where um, uh, one fold is all the tracks in one year, another fold is all the tracks released in another year, and the year information is a side channel that you use to do your partitioning. Uh, so in this case, the analyst provides an extra vector of integers specifying the fold index for each instance. So uh, that's uh, a case. Another common scenario in music is what is called artist filtering, which means that you don't want pieces of music by the same artist to show both in training and testing. Because the idea is that if they come from the same artist, maybe they are recorded the same way, maybe they are very similar, and by splitting them into training and testing, you make the results a little bit better because those are easier than not. So what you can do is simply ensure that an artist gets either exclusively allocated to training or exclusively allocated to testing. So that's called an artist filter. Uh, Subsampling, if there are many instances, so if you use big data sets, then the training time for a classifier can become prohibitive. So what you can do in that case is use a random sample of smaller size for training and testing, and uh, uh, that works pretty well. And uh, if you have an iterative algorithm, so an iterative algorithm does multiple passes over your data, instead of uh, doing uh, picking, let's say, let's say I was doing the algorithm on all of you, instead of picking 10% of you and running the algorithm on that 10% again and again and again as it iterates, what I can do is every iteration I can choose a different subset. So it's a little bit like trying to do a little bit with some data then using a little bit of other data. And it turns out that, that doing that scheme in some cases can be just as good as running it over the entire data and be much more efficient. So uh, there are some efficient algorithms for training support vector machines, for example, uh, that are based on this idea. So um, now we go to measuring classification performance. So once we have done these experiments, we have basically a vector of uh, predicted answers and a vector of ground truth answers. So for each instance, we will have one label for the ground truth and one predicted label by the classifier. So all classification performance metrics are based on this information. For some, the only thing that matters is whether the prediction is correct or not. Uh, some others also matters what the class is and what the type of error is. So we'll talk about that. So the output of these measures can be a single number, a matrix, or a plot, either characterizing the entire experiment or a specific class. So I do have a live question, so that will be interesting. So how common are parallel training algorithms? Addressing the matter of prohibitive training time. Uh, yes, they are, especially these days when people are really dealing with huge data, parallel implementations of training are quite common. 
But even with a non-parallel implementation, you can still process quite large amounts of data with the right algorithm uh, with today's uh, systems. Okay, so hopefully that answers that question. And there we go, back to this. So classification accuracy is an easy one to understand. So it's the number of And you can also calculate it for each class separately. So I could say I have an 80% chance of predicting correctly if you are a basketball player or not. Or I could say that 90% of basketball players were correctly predicted as basketball players and 85% of non-basketball players were correctly predicted as that. Uh, a more informative structure is something called the confusion matrix which is a C by C, where C is the number of classes, matrix M, where each element shows the percentage of instances with ground truth uh, label I that were predicted with label J. So this will become clear with an example. But the confusion matrix reveals information about how classification and misclassification are distributed among different classes. So here's an example that's actually from um, music information retrieval application. This is a, a classic problem of automatic music genre classification. So the overall accuracy is around 80%. And then this acronym stands for the following genres. We have blues, classical, country, disco, hip hop, jazz, metal, pop, rock, and reggae. So if you look at the particular row, uh, if, uh, which is the easiest genre to classify, just looking at this matrix? Classical, because it's the diagonal and it's 94%. So what this means is that 94 of classical instances are correctly classified as classical music. One instance of classical music was misclassified as country, Three instances of classical music were misclassified as jazz, and two instances of classical music were misclassified as rock music. Okay? And if you look at this matrix, it kind of makes sense. The hardest genre to classify is rock music, and that's because rock music tends to have a lot of different styles in it. Uh, and also the errors sort of makes sense. So for example, the largest number of misclassifications for rock music happens uh, with country music. And country music, in some cases, is similar uh, to rock music, or at least much more similar than something like hip hop. Uh, so uh, as you can see, there is no misclassification uh, with hip hop in this case. So the point is that the confusion matrix can give you a little bit more rich semantic information, especially if you have some prior knowledge of what these classes represent and what these classes are. So does the confusion matrix make sense? Any questions? All right. Obviously, uh, this can be expressed as, uh, as a direct number of instances, or you can convert it to percentages if you want, so that it, it's sort of uh, more easy to interpret. Uh, so uh, if you look at a single class, there are four possible outcome combinations of ground truth and prediction. So if you use terminology from binary testing, we have true positives. That means the ground truth and the prediction are both the class that you're examining. So if I have, uh, then you have false positives where the ground truth is not the class, but the prediction is the class, false negatives, and true negatives, where both are not the case. So uh, if you think of them as ones and zeros, you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Uh, so if you look at, even if you look at the multi-class problem, you can still treat each class separately as a binary problem to compute these metrics. And uh, based on this terminology, we can define these metrics of precision and recall. Uh, 
This comes uh, from the information retrieval community, search engines, that kind of stuff. And there's a trade-off between precision and recall. Uh, and it's easy to come up with a scheme that maximizes one or the other. So for example, if you have a classifier that only predicts two instances correctly, so out of a thousand instances, just predicts two instances correctly, it has a precision of one because it only makes two predictions and both of those predictions are correct. So it's like someone who, uh, if, if they make a prediction, it is correct. But the problem is that they miss a lot of other things that could be predicted in their effort to be precise. Uh, recall can go the other way. So if a classifier predicts everything as heavy metal, it will obviously predict all the heavy metal pieces as heavy metal, but also it will predict everything else as heavy metal. So it will have perfect recall, but it will have terrible precision. So these two measures kind of fight each other, and you can combine them in something called the F measure, which is defined like that, and um, uh, is basically a combination of precision and recall. So higher F measure means that more instances of that particular class are classified correctly. Uh, and low F measure means uh, that they are not so well. And accuracy can also be defined in terms of the true positive, true negative, and, and so forth. Okay? So I'm not going to talk about it today, but notice that there are scenarios where errors matter, and they can be given different weights. So an example is medical diagnosis. So if or, um, when you have, um, uh, when you're, someone is pregnant with a child, uh, they have a test uh, that tests for certain genetic abnormalities. Now that test uh, is designed in such a way that if there are genetic abnormalities, it will come out positive. So it might be the case that you are told that, oh, something is uh, dangerous, and you, th your baby might still be OK. Uh, but then you do further testing. And, and uh, what would be what they don't want. But So sometimes it will have false positives, but that's OK. What you don't want to have is false negatives. You don't want to have a case where the baby would be born with genetic abnormalities and the test would miss it. So tests like uh, for uh, HIV or for pregnancies, all that stuff, they try. Uh, errors in one direction are much worse than errors in another direction. So what you want to avoid is someone who has cancer going misdetected, which means that occasionally people will be told that they have cancer, but they don't. Uh, but that's a price you have to pay with these. So classification errors for certain problems can be uh, more nuanced. Uh, so I think that's it pretty much. Uh, in the next data mining lecture, which we will do tomorrow, we will start looking at some specific classifiers. So that concludes the lecture. And I will stop the broadcast. So bye, everyone, remotely. OK. Bye. Say bye to everyone. Bye. Excellent. All right.